People are from Labrador, northern Labrador. My mother was born on a small whaling island off the coast of Labrador called uh, Spotted Island. And that was their summer home. That's where she was born. Uh, when she was young, I believe four, her father, um, her father died. And so she was forced into the residential school. And her brother and sister were already there. They were older. And, and when mom's dad died, her mom ended up having to work at that school as a cook. And so they were there for four years. My mom was there for four years. Her brother and sister were there longer. And they were never allowed to see their mother or to, to wave to her, to speak to her. She was never allowed to ha they were never allowed to have any contact. And because they were there year-round, that was four years in the school um, with barely any contact with each other, let alone their mom. So their mother married um, a white man and moved far away from Labrador to get her kids out of the residential school. And she moved them into a white community and, and would not tolerate anyone accusing them of being Native. Mm -hmm. So uh, my mother would have been around eight years old then, seven or eight. And, and so that was her experience, is going from a warm, loving family and sense of community to a very stark non-Native community that operated very differently. And, and she would speak of being uh, targeted by the community children because they were very clearly different. Um, what I can say for myself, because she, you know, she got married and, and had us, and we continued to live in a white community, and, and that was our experience as well. We were always targeted because we weren't one of them, we didn't fit. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really difficult because we didn't have any connection to any Native community because you know, we were in a completely different province now as well. And, and we didn't have any connection to any local Native communities. I was 39 years old before I experienced my first ceremony. I only learned the English language, and it does not have the vocabulary that resonates with who and what I am. I didn't just look different, I was different. And that's a very painful thing to be as a child and a young adult. We have no connection to our Inuit history. The Mi'kmaq in close to our, the community that we live in, embraced us and, and taught us their culture and accepted us. Um, being so far away and I still don't have any status. My family doesn't have any status and and you know, I didn't always realize how important that was until, because on many levels, I, I could accept not belonging in the non-Native community. I have a hard time feeling like I don't belong in the Native community, and, and that has left me in a limbo my whole life. Um, and, and that, 
that's out of my hands right now. Uh, and that's okay. Um, I have learned that my father's people, uh, many of them came from uh, Mi'kmaq in the Yarmouth area. So at least I feel even more connected to the Mi'kmaq uh, culture. Um, one of my grandchildren got her spirit name when she was three weeks old. That was so profound for me to see my grandchildren learning who they are. We still live in a non-native community and so there are those same realities for my grandchildren. When, when my mother and I would go into the schools during Mi'kmaq History Month and do presentations, one of my granddaughters said, Nanny, if you come to my school, please don't come to my class. And if you come to my class, please don't tell them you're my nanny. Because she didn't want to risk being called the name. She sometimes heard me be called. And so as much as, as they are a lot more acquainted with who and what they are, there's still a lot of fearfulness for being that. Uh, but it's, it's something that we're working on, and so I keep using that to motivate me, mm. uh, to keep trying to do the work, to keep trying to make this world a safer place for my great-grandchildren or my great-great-grandchildren so that th they won't know that limbo and that fearfulness of being who and what they are. Mm. One of the things that my mother f believed with us being Native and living and working in a non-Native community is that maybe in many ways we could be a bridge between the people. And so it really mattered to her to go into the schools whenever we were invited um, and teach them, teach them who and what we are. We even had one one elementary school child, at the end of the day, he came running up to us before running out to his bus saying, when I grow up, I want to be Mi'kmaq. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in doing that work uh, and being out in the community, we've also been invited um, by the staff of our local courthouse. So all the sheriffs and, and every person on staff, save the judges, um, asked us to go in and do a smudge ceremony with them in a talking circle. And they provided us with some of our traditional foods for lunch. And, and it was really beautiful. And, and more and more, um, we're getting invited. My mom struggles with it now a little bit more as she's older. Um, but more and more, we're being asked to go into different professional settings and and teach them, you know, uh, because we, we feel that teaching in a kind and gentle way is, is the way that, that people listen and, and learn and become, you know, um, more interested in learning more. So we, we've always tried to, to take things in and and show them and teach them our, you know, the sec seven sacred teachings. And, and um, I've just joined another committee in my professional life. And they said, oh, we need to bring in the Mi'kmaq community. And I said, you can't. You're not ready. You don't know how to welcome them. You don't know. You can't ask minority people to come in to this very white setting and and expect them to act white. And and so I wrote a native protocol just sort of around that. And and so this new committee, uh, they each have a copy now and they've requested a blanket exercise. So I'm hopeful that, you know, more and more people will will learn and, and understand and move through their fear because I think a lot of the troubles between, between the cultures are we're afraid of each other, you know, and, 
And so I've worked very hard most of my life to be sort of that safe bridge where, where people can find something that they're looking for that is meaningful to them, that they can go home and teach their children or their family or their, their community. That, that keeps both sides safer. I am the executive director of a men's intervention program working on the issues of domestic violence. So what I've found both in that work and, and the work I do cross-culturally, for whatever reason that work chose me. Um, it's not anything that I intentionally sought to do. But I work with, with the men in the Native Circle setting. And, and I listen to them and I support them. And I give them permission to choose to be the man they want to be and not the men that they felt condemned to be. And then I teach them the skills once they've identified who that man is. Then I teach them the skills that they need to achieve that. Oh, yeah.